much. See y'all. Okay, my name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Today is August 1st, 2021. We're here today with Mary Rasa for an interview to augment the exhibit Monmouth County 9-11 and its aftermath. This interview is being recorded with the permission of all participants. Mary, can you just confirm for me that you do indeed consent to the recording and that you understand that this interview will live in the public domain? I, I consent to all those things. Thank you. So tell us just briefly about your early life. Where and when were you born and raised? I was uh, born and raised in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Um, I uh, went to St. Jerome School, followed by Shore Regional High School. I went to Mary Washington College, where I have a degree in historic preservation. Um, and recently, I, I, I obtained a master's of library science. But uh, basically, born and raised in West Long Ridge, lived there until um, we were married, which was just past 20 years ago, in June 2nd of two, uh, 2001. And then we moved to, my husband and I moved to Middletown, um, which is where we were at the time of 9-11. Congratulations on your recent 20th. That's a big milestone. So you were newlyweds, you were living in Middletown in September of 2001. And as far as your work life, you were working for the National Parks, correct? Yes, I worked, I worked for the National Park Service. Um, I started there after my sophomore year in college in 1992. Um, I became permanent a few years after graduation. Um, and I was first a park ranger in interpretation where we worked uh, giving tours and working with the public and answering all the questions and um, at the visitor center as well. And then in 2000, I became the museum curator for Sandy Hook. Um, so I was a little less involved with the public at that time, but I still did give some programs and we did oral history interviews. <laughs> yeah, know all about that. Um, so your regular duty station in September of 2001 was on Sandy Hook? Yes, it was. Okay, so let's dive in then to September 11th. Was that going to be a regular work day for you? And, and how did that day start to the best of your recollection? So we lived off of Kings Highway in Middletown. And um, what I would do is I drove into the park and the first place I would go would be building 47 where the museum collection was, and I emptied a lot of dehumidifiers, um, three I believe every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went there, but that day, uh, the park that Sandy Hook is part of is called Gateway National Recreation Area. And that is also in Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Queens. Um, the park headquarters is located at Fort Wadsworth in New York. And on that day, I was going to uh, do some work at the headquarters building in Staten Island. So I had to go get the uh, government vehicle, which was a Ford Taurus. And it was the only one in our division that would be able to make that trip because all the other ones were uh, really in bad shape and used to like break down on the roads. So um, we were, I was very happy to get the station wagon. Um, I was standing on the loading deck of uh, behind building 47 when my boss came up and he said so you're going to New York today and I said yeah I got all the stuff I got to take care of and at that point I just realized how beautiful the day was it was there was no humidity uh the sky was clear I said it's a gorgeous day for driving and um that's something that stuck with my husband and I when that type of day comes around every September I said it feels like September 11th um so I got in a car drove uh up the parkway and you have to get to the outer bridge crossings and I was on 440. I was listening to uh, WABC talk radio, which was the Curtis and Kuby show, which was very entertaining. Um, Curtis Kuby is, uh, Kuby has passed away, but Curtis Lee was now running for the um, mayor of New York City. So uh, he's still around, but uh, they were just bantering. And at some point they said there was a news break that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. They didn't have any details. I was actually on the approach to the exit, so I really didn't have much of a choice as to what to do. And we, it, it, it wasn't, they weren't in a panic state. It was not a terrorist attack, attack at that point in time. We didn't really know what was going on. So, you know, just listening to what was going on, I was past where you could act. Well, there was bumper to bumper traffic. So I was past where you could exit. And my husband called up, he said, 
he worked on 55 Water Street in Manhattan. He said, you should turn around. And I said, I can't. And I said, he said, it looks bad. And we didn't really know what was going on. So as I got to the bridge, of course, this is all bumper to bumper traffic. Um, it's a suspension bridge and the workmen were standing on the uh, suspension, holding on to the lines. And I looked over and by that point in time, the second tower was also burning and it, you could see them very vividly from the bridge, what looked like two giant smokestacks. I, uh, and it, it, you know, at that point I was like, okay, now what do I do? Because I'm now like trapped. And you have to remember at this point, cell phones were flip phones. There are no cameras on there. There wasn't a whole lot that they would do. Nobody was calling me up to say, hey, turn around because nobody really knew exactly where I was at that point in time. Um, so I proceeded over the bridge and then I was like, okay, let me try to go back. And at the point in the radio, they said all bridges and tunnels are shut down because there's a terrorist attack. And I'm like, oh, okay, now what do I do? So I was wait, I was in the line to go back to New Jersey and I said, well, this is ridiculous. So myself and all these other people drove over the median to go in and I was like, okay, I should just find a place to park. So you're like sitting there, okay, well, what do I do now? So Staten Island, is a little, I'm not really familiar with Staten Island. So it was a little bit hard for me to figure out what to do because I didn't know the streets. There's no GPS, there's no, you know, you didn't have your smartphone telling you where to go. So I kind of knew that if I made it to Father Capitano Boulevard on the South Shore, I might make it to the other parts of Gateway. So on Staten Island, there's Fort Wadsworth, which is all the way over by Brooklyn, but there is also Great Kills Park and Miller Field. I said, well, maybe if I go down there, I had never been to either of those places before. So I said, maybe if I go down on the South Shore, I can find one of those parks and get in. They also said at this point in time that all federal facilities were shut. So I'm like, okay, I'm not in uniform, but I'm in a government car. And hopefully I don't necessarily know a lot of people that work at these units, so I don't know if they're gonna know me. So as I drove around, I eventually, it took me some time. First I went um, to a gas station, then I went, I went to a couple different places. And then I, I finally found Great Kills and standing in front of the entrance, blocking the entrance was a ranger who I knew. So at that point in time, I was like, oh, thank God, I know him. I actually went out on a date with him, didn't like him very much. So, so it was sort of like, oh, okay, great. So I got out of the car, so happy to see him. I gave him a hug and he said, congratulations on your wedding. <laughs> I was sort of laughed. <laughs> I was like, okay. And he said, uh, John Lankos is at the Ranger contact station. I don't think it was a visitor center. I think it was a contact station. I said, okay, I know him too. So let me drive over there. So I drove over there and John said, the boat is leaving. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, the boat is, is leaving um, to go to Sandy Hook. And I was like, no way, really? So he said, well, let me drive you down there. So um, he drove the government car to where the boat, I did again, I had never been to Great Kills, didn't even know that there was a, a, a marina there. I didn't really know what was in the park there. Um, the park service boat was sitting there. That By this point in time, both the towers had fallen down. Radio reports were so wildly um, varying. They were saying things, uh, one of them was, the uh, the mall in Washington D.C. is on fire. I remember specifically them saying that, mm -hmm. but they were talking about different different things as it was going on on the radio. So when I got to the boat, um, there was an IT guy who lived in New Jersey, whose wife was a nurse, and the uh, the Monmouth Medical Center was told that they had to go in. It didn't matter, and they had a toddler. So um, he had to get back as soon as he could because he was supposed, she was supposed to report for work. And he specifically, I remember him telling me this, he said that they had a babysitter. The ba they went to the babysitter, she went to the babysitter and said, can you please watch her? And the babysitter said, no, this is a day of family. And so she didn't know what to do. So he was on the boat. Um, Dave Lucinger, who later became superintendent of the Statue of Liberty, he was the boat captain. He was working at Sandy Hook at the time. And the chief ranger, Ty McNamee, who was a retired um, 
New York City police officer, but he was the chief ranger at the park at the time, and he lived in Staten Island. They were on the boat. As we pulled away, he said, yeah, I was in you know, shock. I was sitting there. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I, I can't believe this happened. He said, it could have been a lot worse. And I just glared at him. I'm like, what? And he said, it could have been chemical or biological. Mm. And I was like, okay. So there was this, you can see the smoke all over Staten Island. But as we pulled away, what was once the towers was just this huge amount of smoke. It, it's the, it looked like smog, but concentrated in the area where the towers once were, and you just you couldn't take your eyes off it. You just kept looking at this smoke and and just over there. It was just fascinating to to look at it. And you're just like sitting there going, oh my goodness, what 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 happened? Um and uh we so we piloted back to Sandy Hook and um when I did get to Sandy Hook, I got down on my knees and touched the ground. I was so happy to be out of there. Um, meanwhile, the whole time that this was going on, as I was driving back and forth on Staten Island, trying to figure out what exactly to do and where to go, my husband was calling me um, and, and they, were, they were sheltering in place. He was on the 49th floor of his building. They were sheltering in place. Um, and when I finally got to the boat and found out that was going to be my way off, um, he had he had called me up. He goes, I can get a ferry to Staten Island. I said, no, 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 I'm good. I, I was taken care of by the Park Service. So you go to, back to Jersey because Steve Streak was offering ferries to get people out as quickly as possible. I said, just go home, just get out of here and, and I'll meet you there. So, um, so yeah, I got down on my knees and I, I touched the ground and I said a little prayer and I had to walk from the Coast Guard station back to my office and I walked into my uh, boss's office and the first thing he did was hand me a phone. He goes, call your parents. Um, and I said, I, I, I did. I called because um, at some point cell phone service in New York was gone. So I couldn't do anything the whole way till we got back to Sandy Hook where there was another tower where I could call. So I called my parents because they were freaking out trying to figure out where it was. If you ever in a disaster, call your parents as soon as possible, help them out. Um, and and he was asking me what, I said, you, know, you could just see smoke and all these different things. So um, after I collected myself a little bit, the, the uh, park superintendent, um, and assistant superintendent said, do you have a uniform here because we're doing patrols? They had closed the park down, but Earl was, the Naval Weapons Station was very concerned that there would be terrorist attacks as well as the Coast Guard Station. So they wanted anybody in uniform to walk the shoreline was basically what they did. I didn't have a uniform at the time, but we also had a, um, we had a landscape architect from the Olmsted Center for Landscape Architecture and, and up near Boston was visiting us and she was supposed to be leaving that day um, and flying out, which obviously didn't happen. So they sent me with her to CBS in uh, East Point Plaza in Atlantic Highlands um, so she could get some toiletries and things that she needed because she was gonna have to spend at least one night. She might've spent two nights there before she rented a car to leave. So I took care of her. And at that point in time, I went, uh, I guess it was about end of the day by this point in time, but my timeline is kind of off. Um, but I knew Anthony had gotten on a ferry to, uh, to Atlantic Highlands and his brother who worked for the New York times, but he hadn't left yet that morning. Um, so he obviously didn't go in. He went and picked, um, him up and we all met back at my in-laws house, which was also in Middletown by the train station. So as I was driving over there, we are driving past the train station and in the train station parking lot full of cars. And you knew that there were a lot of people that weren't going to be ever coming home. It was a very sobering point when you when you saw the train station parking lot, um, and it remained that way for days um, with the car, just a lot of cars still sitting there. So um, we went in and we said a prayer, um, and we ate dinner, and it wasn't until then that I had seen anything on the news. So my timeline information didn't really know that was the first time I saw anything on the news um, and then we went home that night um, Anthony was in a lot of pain because he had run down 49 flights of stairs he was having like leg spasms um, and we watched um, 
the news. The other thing, um, he he had to go through the streets of Lower Manhattan to get to the ferry. So both of his shoes and his pants were had dust on them. So we chose to just take them and throw them out. Um, the the whole idea that there were human remains probably on them. We just wanted to get rid of them at the time. Um, so we went back to our apartment. Um, and the next morning, this was a kind of funny thing. Um, he had an emergency number because the company that he worked for held all the stocks that of the stock exchange and they had these safes. So that was there was a lot of emergency procedures. And that's when you really learn that Manhattan is an island. It's probably not the best place to keep all these things. Um, we had an emergency number. We called the emergency number and it said, because of the emergency in your area, the phones don't work. So that it was just it was just like a little more scary kind of thing. So he didn't know his boss said, "Oh, we're going to be back at work tomorrow." And I, said, I don't think so. Um, so the next morning we went to mass at St. Catharines and Hometel where we belong, and um, they lost. St. Catharines, I believe, lost somewhere in the twenties. Um, there was there was one man who died, and when they finally had his memorial, they were baptizing his child who had just been born right around then. Um, I know that uh, St. Mary's in Middletown, New Monmouth, lost the most parishioners. I think they lost about 30. So uh, we had gone to mass and then there were counseling sessions being offered by different agencies. So we actually, Anthony and I went to a counseling session where we talked through what we had experienced that day. And then um, he was out of work. I, he had to ask him how many days he was out. But I went back to work, I believe, the next day. And they did have a counseling session in groups for the employees. Um, so I remember attending one of those. Um, when you say so, the next day, Mary, you mean the 13th? 13th, I think, is the day I went back to work. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not positive on that, but I'm pretty sure I just stayed out one day. Um, so in the park, um, there were a lot of patrols because they were concerned that something was going to happen at Earl um, to the Navy ship. So rangers were doing patrols. I don't believe I was involved in that. The building that I worked in, Building 102, was an environmental education center. So it was set up to house somewhere around 40 to 50 people. So the Coast Guard reserves were immediately called up and they had like a couple hours notice. So they took over the built. I, I was in a wing separate, but they took over the building and the kitchen facilities. And I just remember one, one guy, he said, I, it, it turned cold and like the next day, and he's like, I don't even have, I only have a short sleeve shirt. So I had a sweatshirt and I let him borrow it for the time he was there because they were, they were sent down so quickly um, to respond. So there was an extra Coast Guard and then we were, uh, the park was doing a lot of patrols. Um, I don't, we were getting a lot of memos um, about different things and we reopened soon, but Stat, uh, the New York units, uh, especially Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island, they didn't reopen for months. Um, they had to figure out how to do security at the statue, especially. Um, so I believe it was a couple months later, C Street gave us a free ferry. There was an all employee meeting at Ellis Island, which was still closed. Um, and we, it was sort of to a morale builder to, to talk to us for all of the New York City parks, which Gateway and Sandy Hook was considered part of them. So we went up that day. You've mentioned a few times the park rangers walking patrols. Uh, most of the rangers are not armed though, right? There's different divisions. I was in interpretation division. There's only like, there's only, there were only like three interpretation. Uh, most of the rangers are law enforcement, so they did carry guns. They are. Okay. Okay. And in September, September 30th, the end of the fiscal year. So I can't tell you how many were still there who hadn't gone back to college or whatever, but there were at least 10, if not 15 law enforcement rangers. Okay. Who are armed. Um, do you recall the smoke blowing towards yes. Sandy Hook, right? Because if you look on aerial maps right that was kind of the direct path of the smoke coming from ground zero is that your recollection as well yes we went out the, the picture behind me is of north pond and that's a view from the observation deck so that was you go out there to see everything 
The other thing that I remember, other than the feeling of the no humidity, beautiful day, was that smell. There was an acrid odor in the air for at least a week, if not more. You, I mean, you could really smell it. Anytime I smell that like burning, uh, maybe a microwave uh, burning popcorn or something, it's that it's the same acrid smell. And that's what we, we smell. And it was still, there was still a smog over the city for at least a week or not. The other thing about the observation deck, other than seeing New York, that was also where you'd see all the airplanes would line up with Sandy Hook to go into to Newark Airport. So it was very surreal what, because there were no airplanes flying. So you would always, it was one after the other, boom, 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 you would, you know, going into New York, but with no planes, it was just quiet. Mm -hmm. The day of September 11th, you've referenced listening to the radio and getting your news that way. As you were in the thick of it that day, was the NPS getting its information via radio like everybody else? Or do you remember if there were special emails or teletypes or anything like that giving you a little extra information or insight? Well, again, because I was on the road, okay. I had no communication with anybody. Um, when I got back, I mean, there were emails, but the email would have been something like federal facilities are shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and what was, and there might've been a recap, but there was not, no other general emails um, coming around at that point in time. Okay. Did Sandy Hook in advance of September 11th do any types of you know, terrorism or emergency preparedness drills or anything like that? Not that I know of, everything really came in after this. I mean, it, you know, the whole threat comms that are on military bases, that didn't exist. I, you could drive on the Fort Monmouth and do whatever you want and drive right through. It was an open base until September 11th. So, I mean, everything changed after that. I mean, I used to go to the Post Library or the Post Chapel um, whenever I wanted. Then, you know, we had to obviously get permission. Yeah. So it was just, and it was Delta at that point in time. It was ThreatCon Delta that day and then thereafter. And I think now it's mostly on Bravo. Mm -hmm. Did you or your family lose anyone on 9-11? No, we did not. Um, we were very fortunate. I did have a, a cousin who was working at the Pentagon and she as well, uh, her mother was having a, a hard time. So they finally got, they had to walk up 395 out of the Pentagon and finally she was able to get a hold of her mom and let her know, I'm okay, we're just walking the highway to get away from it. Wow. You know, it's so fascinating. I think this will be of particular interest to my students. You know, it was only 20 years ago, but technology has made such leaps and bounds since then, right? The ability to instantaneously communicate, the ability to track your kids or, you know, your spouse on their cell phone, uh, the ability to use GPS, right? It really was a different world, technologically speaking, on 9-11. Like, I don't think my cousin had a cell phone. I think she had to borrow it from somebody else. My husband got a cell phone like two months before this. Mm. Um, so we were able to somewhat keep in touch. But I, now cell phone towers were gone in New York and like Fort Wadsworth, the headquarters of the park, all of their, tele their hard line telephone cables were into the World Trade Center. So they did not have phone for months. Wow. We had to, there were emergency phones set up. But the whole like idea of, well, do you have any pictures? Well, no, because the phones couldn't take pictures. I mean, you're talking about email, that, that was the far cry. That, 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 that didn't happen many years later on your our mobile device. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. So you went back to work within a few days and you talked about increased patrols. Um, did anything else change at the hook going forward as a result of 9-11? I think there was a, there was just a lot more vigilance. There were a lot more locked doors. I, this was before there was a common access card for government employees. Um, soon thereafter, we all had to get, a con I don't remember what year it was, but the military had got the common access card much earlier than we did because it was sort of like a joke. Well, who are we going to show it to the raccoons? Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't necessarily lock the door of the building that I worked in. Uh, you know, it, there was a lot more, it was, it was much more lax. Um, any precautions. It, it, people didn't think that way before this, even though there was the attack on the trade center and what was in 93. Yeah. Um, people didn't really think uh, that it was gonna happen here.
Would you say that 9-11 changed you in any ways, your outlook on the world, on your community? Well, my husband lost his job uh, a few months later. So yeah, that changed the the way we, um, uh, we, we had a couple of years, he, he finished. The other thing he was going to get his master's degree at Pace uh, University, which is in lower Manhattan as well. So it changed, he lost his job by in January and he, it, he was out of work for about two years. Um, but he was finishing his master's degree at the same time. So yeah, it very much impacted our life and the way you know, we had to think, how are we going to, to make it in this world? And then, and then at the same point in time, the housing bubble started up where prices of homes uh, got very expensive. So we couldn't even buy in at that point in time. You know, doing the research for this exhibit, there was a call by, you know, local, state, federal government for people to come back into New York and go to shows and go to restaurants. And part of it was showing that we had not been cowed by the terrorists, but also there was this real need to ensure that the economy didn't collapse as a result. So speaking to Anthony's experience shows how that was a very real experience for some people. Well, the whole financial sector, I mean, there was there was just a huge amount of job loss at that point in time. But um, I didn't want to go back to New York for quite some time. I, I had no desire to go there. So it wasn't a couple until a couple months later that I did go. Um, you mentioned attending mass on the 12th. Were you do you consider yourself a religious person before? September 11th, and, and did the day change your relationship with your faith in any way? I, we always attended mass. That wouldn't be anything unusual. Wouldn't attend it normally on a weekday, but obviously for the, for this particular reason. Um, but yeah, it was, it was something I, we needed to do. Yeah. Yeah. They talk about, um, attendance at houses of worship really soaring in the aftermath for several weeks before it kind of petered off again. So that's interesting. A lot of people, when they talk about the period following 9-11, they also talk about this intense patriotism that seemed to exist in its aftermath. Is that your recollection as well? Yeah, because, so I was home the next day, went to the counseling, went to, the, but then like the, the following day when I went back to work, I was kind of shocked with the amount of flags that were everywhere there were flags on everything and it, it was you know you, you like you're like oh you know it was, it was very stressful and all and then you know, I was like wow there's a lot of flag. I mean there's just flags everywhere what about anti-muslim or anti-immigrant backlash do you recall any of that kind of in the air in the aftermath of the day I really had, I worked for the government and I did not really, um, because we were all US citizens, it wasn't something that I was around um, many immigrants or Muslims. I, I don't think I knew any at the time. Okay. And what were your thoughts on the so-called global war on terrorism that followed 9-11? Uh, I mean, it, it had to be done. Should we have been in Afghanistan for 20 years? Probably not, um, but it was, it was something that we had to go take care of. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else about the day that you remember that you'd like to add for us? Uh, it, it, if you're talking about terror attack, it, it did, it, it was, it was terrorizing. It was, it was frightening. And especially being not at home, not at work on unfamiliar location and just trying to figure out, I mean, the, I had to have said a prayer that I found this park and by getting to that park that I, you know, that I knew the people there and that there was a boat to take me home that was all, I mean, I, that, I, that really had to say my blessings that all that worked out. Otherwise I would have probably sat in the park for a number of hours till they reopened the bridges and tunnels, mm -hmm. but um, that it all felt, everything fell into place for me that day. I, I really thank God for that. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, 
in doing this exhibit, I'm hearing so many incredible stories of how individuals from Monmouth County were impacted that day. And it, it's really unique. And I thank you for sharing your experiences for the historical record. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and stop.